We want the truth, so watch Truth Wanted live Fridays at 7 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc slash yttw and call into the show at 512-991-9242 or connect to the show online at tiny.cc slash call tw. Welcome to the Atheist Experience. I'm Matt Delaney. Joining this week, Arden Hart. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. So excited to be back. Long time no see. We're going to jump right into calls here in just a second. I'll have some announcements later on. But right off the bat, we have uh, a question and a call from Jake in Canada. Pronouns are he, him. Uh, welcome, Jake. What, what was your question? Hello. Can How you doing? Yeah, we're doing well. Awesome. Um, I've been listening for a long time. Uh, it's an honor to talk with you. You're one of the original shows that I found. So uh, I well, was, we're glad you found us. So there was a, a question we were going to get to here. So where are we at? Yeah. Absolutely. So one of the things that I noticed is, and, and I've noticed that it's happened on some of the calls that you've had as well, is that you cannot get a straight answer out of people when they ask when, when you ask them the most obvious questions that should just be a simple yes or no. Um, I know your personal hobby horse is slavery. Um, I can't remember how many times you've just point blank asked people if it's wrong to own people as property and they dance around it like they're tap dancing to save their lives. Um, yeah. And the last time I spoke to somebody about it, I, I asked them about this idea of original sin, which to me has always seemed absolutely obscene. Because essentially, you're being punished for something you didn't do, right? Even if this actually happened, which we don't have any reason to believe that it did, even if that actually happened, well, I didn't do it, you didn't do it, nobody else did it, and yet we're being punished with some sort of wicked nature as if we had. And the last time I actually spoke to somebody about this topic, I just, I could not get a straight answer out of the guy. I asked him, Please just tell me yes or no. Is it wrong to punish somebody for something they didn't do? It's a yes or no. I need a yes or no here. They couldn't give me an answer. Every okay. time they started answering, they started saying, well, the Bible says X, Y, and Z. And it shouldn't matter what it says. And, and ultimately, if you're worshiping someone who would punish you for something you didn't do, it seems to me like you're almost you and I are more moral than the guy that this guy is worshiping. Sure. And, and so ask the question, ask, ask me and Arden the question. Ask, sorry, ask you what? Ask, ask us the question. So the question is, is it wrong to punish somebody for something that they didn't do? No. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's not wrong. It's not wrong. You were expecting a yes, as were, would most people. So th oh, there's, oh, a prob a, sorry. Yeah. Th there's a problem with the question, and that is, if I was supposed to do something and did not do it, then you could frame it as if I'm being punished for something that I didn't do. But what I'm really being punished for in that case is for not doing the thing that I'm supposed to do. And, and so, and once you get past that expectation, the question that you're really asking is, d does someone be, deserve to be uh, punished for an act that they had no part in? And the answer, of course, is no. Right. So something, somebody else's crime, really. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, there's no such thing. Like, if I do something wrong, you guys shouldn't punish Arden for it. She, she, she just agreed right. to sit here and do the show. It's not her fault if I'm a dick. Right, right. Um, and, and one of the things I asked him is, can you think of anything that you could do that would be fair to punish your descendants for? And, and he said, well, no. 
And I said, it wouldn't make any sense, even if I were related to Hitler, it wouldn't even make any sense to punish me for what Hitler did because I wasn't even around. So how does it possibly make sense to say that, well, people are bad, people are inherently bad because the first two guys screwed up. And because of that, the first two people rather screwed up because of that, everybody else gets screwed over because of what they did. That seems almost North Korean to me. That's the only place I can think of where they actually do that. Or if you commit a crime, they, they put three generations of your family in prison. Certainly authoritarian. Or, or just immoral. And then they want to, and then they want to use that as some sort of, Oh, oh, well, the book is the good book and the rest of it makes total sense. And this is stuff we should follow. We haven't even gotten past the first book and we're pub punishing people for something they didn't have a part in. And you want to, and now you want to tell me that this is a book about morality. Well, I mean, maybe it's about what not to do <laughs> as far as I know. Yeah. I, I don't know that there's, that you're going to get any, any more clear of an answer. I mean, maybe that maybe, maybe there's some apologists that will call in today and say, Oh, no, here, here's the right answer. And here's what, what uh, Jake misunderstood, you know, but I, I'm, I think generally we're both with you. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. On that note, it seems like, yeah, go ahead. On that note, Jake, I'm going to drop you like a bad habit and move on to some other callers. Cause the lines are filling up quickly. And since we're in agreement, let's see if we can't get something beyond agreement here. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Thanks a lot, Jake. So we're not actually going to go like super rapid fire, but I definitely like, I want to have a show. I, we've done this like once or twice in the past. And usually I, I think I'd done it maybe 10 years ago on an episode where I was the only person here. Like I didn't have a co-host. It's just going to be, I'm going to take as many calls as I can, as fast as I can, screw the screeners. We're just going to do it all. We're not doing that today, but I do want us to move along a, a little, a little more quickly. So Let's get some announcements out of the way. First of all, you might be surprised to be seeing me sitting here uh, because today was supposed to be Shannon Q and Arden. And unfortunately, uh, our dear friend Shannon had a death in the family and is uh, unable to, to be here today. And so we wish her and her family uh, all the best through this time. Uh, and our hearts are with them. And since I was around, they said, hey, would you do the show? And I'm, I can't say no. I mean, unless there's, unless there's like a, you know, if something serious going on elsewhere, I'm not going to say no, but how are you today? I'm, I'm good. I've been busy all day doing my normal Sunday routine. I mean, I was with you this morning, so, you know, you know how my, my day has been pretty much, but uh, yeah, it, I'm definitely super, super uh, sad that Shannon obviously would, that there was a loss in her family and that she can't be here because I know we were both really looking forward to doing a show together uh, since we both have very similar backgrounds um, and how we approach this kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, I'm sure there will be another show eventually where Shannon and I can tackle it together, but I'm, I'm still excited nonetheless. Shannon, when she is ready to come back and do shows again, is welcome to take my place any single week that she wants to in order to sit here uh, with you and do the do the makeup show and maybe maybe more of them. Let's let's just get rid of me entirely and let, let you guys take over. Uh, but if you're watching us live, welcome. We greatly appreciate it. If you just tuned in, uh, well, I don't I don't know what the problem is because you know daylight savings time the the time change should have had you here an hour early and so if you're tuning in now maybe you thought we wouldn't be taking any calls but we've already taken a call and we've got a lot more calls to take we appreciate everybody who's tuning in and participating if you're watching us live in chat directly below it there's a donate link that you can go down there and click on 100 percent of your donations go to the atheist community of austin they don't pass uh, and google doesn't take a cut youtube doesn't take a cut and they go to contribute to all of the efforts that we do here you can also get your own Atheist Experience merchandise. Uh, Tiny.cc slash merch ACA is the short URL to actually get there, get everything that you want. Uh, you can also become a member on YouTube and the membership not only gets you cool little uh, emojis and icons to use in chat, but it gets you out of slow mode when we have to go into slow mode as chat sometimes becomes unmanageable. And you can become a supporter at patreon.com slash the Atheist Experience. 
there are a couple of forums we've been directing people to. And I want to point out these are all unofficial forums. I'm, we, we don't manage these. These are fan run. Um, but there's the Atheist Experience fan group, which is uh, facebook.com slash group slash AXPFG. And then there's the Atheist Experience private fan group, which is the exact same thing, except it's AXPPFG. And the show, uh, after the show's over, Arden and I will both be hanging out on the unofficial ACA Discord, answering some questions there. That Discord is up all the time. So if you are wanting to engage with people, um, this is still the atheist community of Austin. And while COVID has put a damper on our let's meet up and hang out in person kind of community, uh, we still value participating uh, with the broader online community. So we'll be there after this. You can be there anytime. And that's dynacc slash ACA Discord. And finally, for this round, if you have feedback, questions, criticism, concerns, things like that, uh, if you wanted to call in and you didn't get to call in or you thought you weren't uh, connected properly or you, you think that a call screener or a mod, you know, I don't know, uh, wasn't taking you seriously or whatever, who, who, know, who knows what your complaint could possibly be, you can email tv at atheist-community.org. And that's not just for complaints. We also want to hear from people in the community, find out what's going on with you. You can share your experiences. And when you're looking for um, like-minded people, sometimes we can point you there like we do here when we point you to the, the Discord and the fan groups. Let's get on to more calls because that's what the that's what people love a lot. Um, oh yeah, Andrew in New York, pronouns are he him, would like to explain modern paganism. Most of the tenets are metaphorical. Well, Ooh. hey Andrew, how are you? Good, Matt. How are you doing? I'm all right. Good. Um, yeah, just a, in response, last week you took a call. Um, someone who came to the worship store. And uh, when asked why, of course, uh, his explanation was, was pretty ham-fisted and you were understandably befuddled. I'm an atheist. I don't hold to paganism. Um, but some years ago, I got sort of reluctantly involved with a group of pagans. And um, this was 15 years ago. I was just getting into the whole what do you believe and why type of conversation. And, hey, Andrew? Uh, the, the minister... Yes. Uh, yes? Hello? So my, if I'm understanding you correctly... You're not a pagan. No. Okay. Uh, no, don't no, take this no, the no, wrong no. way. Um, don't take this yeah. the wrong way, but I don't see how it can possibly be good for a non-pagan to call in to offer even a better understanding of paganism than a pagan, because anything that that person got wrong, they can just say, well, you're not a pagan. Where's, what, where's your, what you're pointing to? And anything that you get right or that's confusing, some other pagan. I want to hear from genuine like people who hold to those views, it would be like having, you know, an atheist buddy of mine call in and tell us all about Mormonism. Oh, that's fair enough. Understood. Um, just wanted to give him my two cents. I spent some time toying with the idea, but yeah, yeah uh, I'm not the expert. Well, I'll give you like 30 seconds or so to say kind of what your thoughts were on the time, but there's really not much we can do with it. I, I want to engage with somebody who actively believes that. Um, oh, fair yeah. enough. Um, all right, read it quickly. Um, the idea, as, of, as it was explained to me, uh, was that there's no belief that any god or gods that they talk about actually exist. And they're really meant as sort of placeholders to elevate the human experience. So when they talk about this is a, uh, the goddess of love, we, there is no goddess of love. It's just a way to, to, to celebrate the idea that we can experience that as humans. And in a, a sense, it was sort of explained to me as an almost spiritual humanism. Um, I, I think that's really interesting and I, I i find that interesting and if that's if you were to like send me a poll that said that's what the majority of pagans believed that's totally cool but i i it's frustrating because i've had this conversation with a couple of pagans before and i feel like they have explicitly said that that's not what they believe that they do legitimately believe in in pagan gods but i i feel like I keep getting so close. People keep like dangling this carrot of what pagans actually believe in front of me, but nobody actually like really just ge gives me what, what do you actually believe? Cause I mean, that that's no different than, than believing in like just the concept of love generally. So I, I, I don't know. I, I appreciate you calling in and explaining yeah. to us what you understand, but it's just 
frustrating because I want to know what pagan people actually believe so I can actually have real conversations with them. But I feel like it, it's so elusive. I, I keep getting, uh, you know, uh, dismissals on grounds of how personal it is or or this sort of thing where it's a metaphor for them personally, but not every pagan. So like, I, I don't know, what, what am I supposed to do with that kind of definition? You know, that's like someone redefining any concept as a god. Yeah, it'll it'll wind up being, and this is what I'm trying to avoid. And no no fault with you at all, Andrew. Uh, what you what you tell me could be completely correct, and it could even represent the majority of pagans or any and any number of other things. But I run the risk of somebody, you know, in much the same way that many people weren't happy with the last pagan who who called in and and tried to defend some of this. Hmm. They're going to be less impressed, and they're going to you know call you know like no true Scotsman fallacies or you know uh, like uh, how how could you have somebody on to explain something when that's not what they are? And so I've dealt with this before with with Christianity on the show, and that is there are a number of different versions of Christianity. Uh, there's as many different versions probably as there are people, and when one Christian calls in and says, here's what I believe. There's a million other Christians out there that are going, that's not what I believe. And I'm a Christian too. And that's, this is why I don't make, or I try not to, uh, I'm usually pretty careful about it. I try not to make grand statements about what Christianity is. I don't get to define Christianity. All I can do is address the, 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 the religion or the belief of whoever's calling in. So that's why we're always like, what do you believe and why? And do you think somebody else should do it? Um, Otherwise, we'd end up having a show where it would be like, what do you think somebody else believes? And then we get nowhere. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, all I can do is explain to you what uh, was explained to me. But of course, that was just one guy in one church. Yep. Anyway, I appreciate the effort, Andrew, but I'm going to get on to some other calls. Certainly. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. If you are a, a, a pagan um, who holds to that, label and has you know you, you want to call in and explain what it is that you believe in why both are important i'm more interested in the why than the what but the what we have to discuss and one of the key things we're always looking for not is not just what do you believe in why but why do you think other people should believe it you know we're, we're, what's the value what's the demonstration of truth because if we were to to say hey uh i want to believe things if they're true that could be different from somebody else like there are people who i'm i didn't think this was the case but i can be becoming more and more convinced that in certain areas they really don't care whether or not it's true they care about whether or not it's, you know like if, i always i should ask you know if you don't care about the truth try closing your eyes and walking across you know a busy highway uh you, you're going to start caring about the truth of whether or not there's a bus coming but I think people are maybe putting types of beliefs into boxes. And so for things that functionally deal with physics and reality here, like, are you going to get smushed by a bus? Well, of course they care about that truth. But for other things, maybe they don't care about the truth as much. Maybe it's more about, does it feel good? Which is why we keep hearing about, oh, this is kind of metaphorical. I don't know. Where are you at? Yeah, I, I mean, it. that's very much been my my experience too that they they tend to group things up like this but um i, I don't know I, I find these sort of more flowery things almost kind of annoying because it feels like i'm being obfuscated from like the reality of the situation what i'm trying to get to and knowing that there are some people out there who do believe in like a literal thor or something is like okay that's cool that's interesting so like explain it to me <laughs> but it's always just been these sort of vague gestures towards metaphorical concepts and the universe and physics and the cosmos or whatever. Um, but I definitely want someone to call in if you're in the audience right now and you can explain it to us, please, please do. I genuinely, I genuinely want to understand. Well, we do have a couple of theists online and hopefully we'll get into some discussions. Remember the, the primary point about this call, this show is for you to call and tell us what you believe and why. And while we generally focus on, you know, the big questions of is there a God or the supernatural, et cetera, um, there are other things too. And there are things that Arden and I may or may not be correct about. Um, and if we're wrong, we, we, I know, I know us both pretty well. We would both like to find out that we're wrong so we can stop being wrong. But uh, there are a couple more announcements to get to before we get to, to calls. And that is, if you want to engage, uh, you can, in fact, call the show. 
there's no guarantee that you're going to necessarily get through right off the bat. Um, we do have call screeners. Their job is not to get rid of the best calls. Their job is to get rid of people, uh, or not to get rid of people, but to pass through the calls where somebody's actually spent some time thinking about it, put together an argument, may have some defense, and is interesting. And so if you don't get through the first time, don't take that as a, as a, oh, I give up, you know, screw that. Just take some time to, to write down stuff on paper because some people I know, I've been doing this show for 16 plus years. There are some people who, who tune into the show and are like, oh, well, that's wrong. I'm going to call in right now. And they haven't taken a second to take, take a breath and figure out what it is that they want to say. All we're trying to do is make sure that all sides are, are represented um, in, in the best way they can. But there's ways for you to participate in uh, debates and discussions beyond just this show. And in addition to those Facebook groups I mentioned earlier, there's also the Atheist versus Theist Debates Group, which is another unofficial group where you can go and engage in discussions like that. And this program airs on Sundays from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Central. Uh, and Talk Heathen aired earlier today. But in between Talk Heathen and Atheist Experience, you might have been able to listen to an episode of The Nonprofits, which I'm told is the flagship show of the Atheist Experience Network. But all of those programs are available as audio-only podcasts. And your one-stop destination for all of our podcasts is tiny.cc slash AEN podcast. You can find Talk Heathen, Atheist Experience, Secular Sexuality, which airs on Thursday nights, Truth Wanted, which generally airs on Friday nights, although we just did a live Truth Wanted from the Disco Hotel last Sunday for uh, Halloween, which was lots of fun. And I'm, I'm told there were even possible ghosts that made an appearance that might have looked a little bit like us. Yeah, I, I heard the girl one was super hot. So I, I, I heard that too. But... Uh, all of this is possible because of one of the most amazing crews that you're going to find anywhere, if not the most amazing. They, th those people right there, some of whom are busy screening your calls. One of them looks like he's at an amusement park uh, or really wishes he was in an amusement park. Um, they're there working on the audio, on the video. Um, but in addition to the people that you see on that screen, there's also moderators in the chat. And there are people who are taking notes on the show and marking timestamps so that we can use them for a, a variety of different purposes. Huge thank you to all the people who are volunteering to do all kinds of stuff for the ACA in general. Uh, I think that's all the announcements that I had to do right now. So awesome. let's dig in. We, we, we have a theist. Uh, if it's taken it, there we go. Mike in Texas, pronouns are... I mean, my, which I'm not convinced are pronouns, but anyway, uh, welcome, Mike. That's okay, we could have that conversation. Hey, what's up, brother? So um, first things first, I'm going to send you an email. I want to see whether or not it's going to be possible to get your speaking fees, and I can arrange that those paid if it's something you want to do. Secondly, in a lot of different circumstances, these don't adequately represent um, really the cutting edge of theism because there's different levels of it. There's different psychological uh, levels to which people represent their experience. And I think that the problem that you're really contending with is that you have a hard time with mythological theism. So people who think of theism at a mythological level, they confuse the symbols for the reality. That's a problem. More fundamental to that is when people confuse magical thinking with the reality, which is also a problem. And there's levels of theism beyond that. There's levels of theism which take place at a mental structure of reality and even at an integral structure of reality to which they become self-identical with certain psychological states. So in this particular instance, if you look to the Far East, you look at the, at the Vedanta Dharmic traditions, right? When you're looking to the Far East, if you're looking at Brahman, you're looking at Buddhism, God is self-identical with the actual ground of psyche. God is considered the fundamental ground condition of the psyche. And God is considered a self-evident reality because you cannot deny the existence of God without denying the existence of your psyche. Okay. So when you actually anchor this back into this, uh, like thinkers such as Arthur Schopenhauer, Arthur Schopenhauer borrowed a substantial amount of this information from the Far Eastern traditions. So, so Mike? It becomes the actual, f yes. Okay, I, want, I just want to make sure that nobody gets lost here, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that just got thrown out rapid fire. Um, sure. When, you, when somebody says that God is identical with the actual ground of psyche, um, I don't know what the actual ground of psyche is. I don't know anybody who has actually demonstrated what the actual ground of psyche is. Um, and I think that that, in my view, is someone a, a situation where someone has, has confused a, a metaphorical uh, or, or a, a, um, 
what's the right word, a, a construct that we use to describe something that happens and they are kind of like anthropomorphizing it. Because to me, if the ground of psyche is like, let's say, mm -hmm. just the brain, well, the brain is me. There's nothing, no reason, there's no evidence to, to point to something outside of the brain or that my, who I am persists beyond the brain. And so can we do a better job of saying, okay, within this view of theism, God is co-equal with the ground of psyche, but that doesn't tell anybody anything. So can we, can we get to a clearer definition? Well, me, and by me, the way, me, I, I want to make me, sure, let me, let me, and, let me hang on, hang on. By the way, I, I don't want like a dissertation on 20 different versions of theisms that, or theism. That, that, I'm interested in what, what you actually believe and why. Sure. I, I'm getting to that. So let uh, so first, I think that there's a couple of false conflations in the presentation of your argument. I'm going to try to take everything that you say charitably because I'm not going to be like the traditional theist that just basically asserts things dogmatically. Um, consciousness is the one thing in the world that cannot be an illusion. Sam Harris is on board with this. So consciousness is self-evidently the case. Okay. Hang on. If you did not, if you did not, Mike. Oh, so this goes back to Renee. Mike, Dewey. Mike, I, I got to pause again for this. I, I'm going to let you finish. Uh, I don't give a flying fuck what Sam Harris is or isn't on board with, and not, nobody that you cite by name, whether it's Einstein, Schopenhauer, whoever, it, that's not going to have any impact on me at all. I only care about the definitions, the evidence for it, et cetera. Now, I, I'm of the view that consciousness is a product of the brain, and I'm fine with something like the cogito, I think, therefore I am, being a demonstration that at least there must be a me to fool. However... As Hobbes pointed out, that's contingent on the primacy of reason. So I don't want to. So I just don't want it to be confused here. Your primacy. Let's take your primacy of reason. Let's take the ergo cogito sum, and let's backtrack to what you just said about the brain. So in this particular instance, this is why we have to deal with things from the primacy of consciousness, not the primacy of objective reality, because we run into contradictions. And the reason being is because brains are actually discovered in the mind. We have a mind first before we cut open skulls to make an observation. But what it is that when we cut open a skull to make an observation, we have a series of electromagnetic radiation shining through what we ostensibly refer to as, our, as the evidence of the senses. It gets processed through whatever mechanisms are unfolding in that process, and then suddenly it prompts a visual construal as to what we might interpret post facto as a brain. But the brain, by the time that we encounter it, is already a structure of consciousness presenting itself to consciousness. But, but that's, no, 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 that, that's true for everything, and the evidence that we the, the only thing I mean, we're not going to beat the problem of, of hard solipsism here so when we're talking about yes oh, before I, we could actually find and touch and see and probe a brain our brains which the evidence seems to show produce our mind or the thing that we call our mind or that does our thinking and 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 the analysis of sense data for us um it was shielded from us but that doesn't change the fact that this is the thing that's doing that work well, this is the thing, Matt. The, part, the problem with that is that's a praxeological leap of faith that is presumed in the scientific method. And what I mean by that is that in order for science to actually unfold in a rational way, there are certain presuppositional beliefs that we actually have to have about the scientific method in order to get at the data. One of them is that hard solipsism is not possible to basically take as a stance because it undermines the entire scientific endeavor. But well, what, what no, I'm is that, that you don't have to. No, no, no I'm sorry, but that's, that's just, wow. We don't have to assert that it's impossible. We just have to not be able to do it currently. If somebody can solve the problem of hard solipsism, and I don't think that they can, I think that we, we've demonstrated that reason is not going to let you do that. Just to, you know, even through the countless views of, hey, you have to have a primacy of something, and right now it's, it's reason. But the fact that we can't, it, science isn't saying, by the way, there is no supernatural. What they're saying is we don't have the ability to investigate and confirm the supernatural's impact on reality. So there's a difference between methodological naturalism, which is a pragmatic um, a treatment of this, and then philosophical naturalism, which is an assertion that I don't hold to. So, so there's a couple, yeah, there's a couple of problems in the things that you basically said. There's a lot for me to unpack. Um, Let's take the idea of naturalism, and, and this is one of the reasons why I think that you and I actually need to have a conversation in front, of, in front of a university or someplace, because I don't really think that you're used to being able to talk to people that could hang with you at the level that you deserve to be hanging with. And I don't think that you're used to being able to communicate with a theist that's, that's at my level. I think we deserve to actually have the conversation. And I'm Well, hang, hang on. I don't know who you are at all, Mike, and I'm not saying, you know, maybe, maybe the show isn't the best place to start with all this. 
But considering I've had some debates with some pretty heavy hitters within theism, um, we've, we've done that, and they haven't really made any progress on this. So instead of us bouncing all around to naturalism and, and, and 20 other topics... Let, let, me answer the question, let, me, uh, let me answer the question and why naturalism itself presupposes God. It's, it's presupposed. No, 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 sir. No, sir. Naturalism. Are you talking about philosophical naturalism or methodological naturalism? I'm, ta I'm talking about scientific naturalism. Let me explain. No, 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 no. That's not what I asked. Philosophical, science, philosophical and scientific naturalism are, are virtually the same thing. Yes. No, they're not the same thing. It is the difference between saying we are going to begin. Scientific. By, by, no, no. It's the difference between asserting that someone is innocent and not being convinced they're guilty. Science, as a methodology, says, hey, we don't currently have any way to detect whether or not there's anything that is truly supernatural and whether or not it can interact with the world. We have no way to demonstrate that the supernatural exists or that it can manifest in any detectable way in the world. Philosophical naturalism asserts that the natural world is all that exists. Those are two different things. One is the assertion of innocence, and the other one is saying, hey, I don't have enough reason to conclude that you're guilty. Okay. That's different. Philosophical naturalism, as you define it, would contradict itself. Let's deal with scientific naturalism in this particular instance. Okay, and scientific naturalism is no one has made, the, the case has not been made for the supernatural. And I'm, so therefore we don't get to appeal to it. I'm about to, I'm, I'm, I'm about to make the case for the supernatural. Good, let's do it. Scientific natural, so, all right, so scientific naturalism, let me make two different arguments because once these are understood, it becomes pretty apparent that we're left, to, we're forced into a situation. How about you make one argument first and we address that? Because right now we're going on and on and we're getting nowhere. I, 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 there's there's yeah. six other callers waiting and there's thousands of people watching. I'm going to make an argument to the theory of everything. So science endeavors to produce a theory of everything. And in order for science to actually achieve a theory of everything, there needs to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the description it provides and the object it describes. Now, the fundamental language which science attempts to en or endeavors to describe things in terms of is mathematics. So if science is actually to be describing the ultimate object of reality, the ultimate of object, the object of reality must also be a mathematical reality to one-to-one -one correspondence which basically means the a priori presuppositions of science and attempting to describe anything mathematically must basically be describing another mathematical mind with a one-to-one -one correspondence. And if that's the case, it's describing another mathematical mind with a one-to-one -one correspondence, that is precisely the limit of what scientific knowledge could ever produce is another mind. Okay, I, I'm going to sit here and point out that I, I took some notes. I reject absolutely, well, all right, let me not say it. I reject virtually everything you just said, and it's not particularly relevant because if scientists are looking for a theory of mind, it doesn't matter if scientists are ultimately flawed in their attempt to find, or sorry, a theory of everything, in their attempt to find a theory of everything. Maybe there isn't a theory of everything. Maybe this endeavor of theirs to find a theory of everything is a fruitless, pointless, mistaken search, but it's irrelevant to whether or not, whether or not philosophical naturalism Presupp presuppose I, I swear I let you talk. Could I could I address what I had the issue that I have with what you said about my position? Because it's not an No, because I'm not done fucking talking yet. Have you learned that give me some space to finish what I'm saying and then I'd let you talk? Okay, go ahead. Your 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 case here is about a theory of everything. A, we don't currently have a theory of everything. B, it may be a mistake for people to be seeking a theory of everything. C, I don't think that your description of what a theory of everything would necessarily require as a one-to-one -one correspondence is in fact what people are searching for. And since we haven't found it yet, it's still irrelevant. I don't give a rip about a theory of everything until it's actually a theory that has been demonstrated, tested, sent for peer review, and everything, and this is when we start looking at it as if it's a model. Your, your objection here is essentially scientists are doing something that I don't think they're going to be able to do. Well, okay. okay, I'm not convinced they can do it either. I don't even view string theory as science. You, my argument, you're attacking an argument I don't have because I got 50% of the way through it when there was a red herring introduced and dragged me off what I was attempting to say. The red herring was a theory of everything because it doesn't exist. And therefore, if you start with a theory of everything, you are starting with something that isn't science in your attempt to, 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 to criticize science. Excuse me, Matt. That's the position that I didn't say it existed. What I'm talking about a position that, that PhD physicist Max Tegmar formulated. It's his argument. Okay. Like, 
Let me explain to you. No, I'm done. His position. I'm not trying. I, I'm done. I'm done wasting the audience's time on this. Put together an email. Let's have a conversation. I don't care who you can point to that cites anything. There isn't Courier theory of everything. And if there, and, and the fact that some scientists are pursuing something does not mean that there's a fundamental problem with science. It may be that there's a fundamental problem with their model, which hasn't been demonstrated yet because we've neither established nor debunked this theory of everything. You, you have started off with something that is irrelevant. Yeah, I, that's not even the argument I'm saying. Please let me say my argument. Then you wasted your one and only opportunity to get an argument out by starting with something that's irrelevant. Let's try it again some other time, but I'm done wasting time on this today. What I was attempting to say is that if it's not a... I don't know what's so difficult about I'm done with this today. Yeah, I, I mean, if anything, there might be something to his point at the beginning of the call that, you know, this format is maybe not sufficient always for getting to the truth of the matter about some of these issues. Um, that may well be, but it, it definitely doesn't help when I, I, I mean, what he was talking about by the end of that call was not at all related to the claims about God being the mind <laughs> from the beginning of the call. So if the format's not great, that may well be, but you're definitely not making it any better by, uh, trying to rattle off as many philosophical as much philosophical jargon as you can by the time you I mean up I, I can summarize I, I I deleted the notes because I don't need to keep them but I can summarize that which is hey I think you're really cool Matt and I don't think you've had a good conversation with a really smart theist but I'm a really smart theist and Sam Harris agrees with this point that I made and somebody else agrees with this point that I make so let me point out how science actually presupposes the existence of God and that philosophical naturalism which I know you don't hold to which is irrelevant to this I mean you just keep going and going and going try decaf first of all and try learning that in this kind if we're going to have these conversations uh, we need to go point by point. And if I, if you say, okay, let me present my argument, and you start by talking about a theory of everything, you've already lost because there is no theory of everything. You might as well, you could have made the same argument that you made about the, the theory of everything against uh, like a Lamarckian version or phrenology. At some point, scientists might have been looking into phrenology to see if it maps to something, and there might be a fundamental flaw there. The fact that some scientists want to reach something is separate from whether or not there's a problem with science. Sure. Yeah. On that note, maybe Mike and I can have a great conversation some other time in some other format. But I mean, that was like a, a gish gallop of irrelevancy for a while. There. Yeah. I, I kind of felt like when you watch a toddler run around really fast and you, you get kind of tired just by, by watching them. That's how I felt. But through listening, I was. Well, we've got Robin in Washington, D.C., pronouns are he, him, who says that neutrality to belief in God is not possible logically. Um, well, I, I, I don't. How is it? How is it impossible logically, Robin, for someone to be neutral on the position of whether or not they're convinced there's a God? Um, I'm not convinced there's a God, but that doesn't mean that I'm convinced there's not a God. W where am I logically wrong? Hello. Robin, did you go off and take a nap? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I might have cut out. Am I good now? Yep, yep, you're here. Welcome. All right. Sorry about that. Um, yes. So, yeah, the position the position that no one is neutral towards God, yes. So every everyone operates under a metaphysical framework, meaning that they're going to operate under a, a set of assumptions or a set of beliefs that they hold to that are going to answer questions such as what does it mean for things to be facts? What does it mean for things to be true, false, uh, possible, impossible, etc.? Everyone's going to be operating under under some metaphysical framework. Well, I wouldn't call it a metaphysical framework. I'd call it an epistemological framework. No. Metaphysical, what does it mean for things to be facts? That's, ontolo that's ontology. Or things to be possible or impossible, that's ontology, not epistemology. So a metaphysical framework, that that is what Generally speaking, that's what we're going to be talking about when it comes to uh, how people operate. So everyone, everyone operates under some under some metaphysical framework, even if they cannot fully articulate it. And sure. because of the nature of metaphysical frameworks, wh whatever framework that they hold to, if they believe that their framework is true, then they're going to be forced to reject anything that is not the metaphysical framework that they hold to. So when it comes to belief in God, God is in the category of a metaphysical framework. So, or a metaphysical Robin. Text. Robin, rejecting a claim does not mean accepting its contrary. 
I, I can reject. So it's like somebody can come and tell me that um, Arden committed a crime and I can say, I do not believe that because the burden of proof hasn't been met yet, but that is not equal. It is not equivalent to me saying Arden is innocent. That's not, um, that's not what I'm talking about. I said, if you believe something is true, then you're going to believe this negation is false. It's logically, it's logically necessary that you have to believe this negation is false. Y yes, but I'm saying if I'm not convinced that something is true, that does not mean that I'm convinced that it's false. Wait, we lost him. Oh. Well. I guess we just lost a call. Uh, so I, I, I will, in, in case he calls back, stand uh, moderately corrected because I misheard him. And so I suppose it is a metaphysical, metaphysical framework um, as to whether or not, um, or uh, as to the definitions of what is or isn't a fact. But my posi the position on God is about epistemology, not ontology. And so God is a claim and you have some framework that determines whether or not you are convinced that that claim is true. And the mere fact that I'm not convinced that claim is true does not mean that I am in fact convinced that it's false. If I am convinced that it's true, I cannot then also be convinced it's false. But this is why we use propositional logic. The proposition is some God exists. You either accept that or you reject it. But if you reject the proposition some God exists, that does not mean that you accept the contrary proposition that no gods exist. Yeah, but. by that standard, you would have to spend your entire life debunking every asinine thing that people claim to believe in. Because if you don't believe it, then it must be you're rejecting it and you have yeah. some sort of burden of proof there. Yeah, and to be fair, um, I'm not neutral towards a god. I'm not saying that I'm stuck 50-50. Um, I'm saying that I am not convinced that a god exists. I'm open to being convinced. I am not convinced that God exists. And for any given God that I maybe haven't heard of or whatever else, I may not. I may also not be convinced that, that God doesn't exist. But there are gods that I am convinced don't exist um, if they have properties that contradict um, nature. Hopefully, uh, we'll get that call back. But if, as I mentioned, you haven't been keeping up with all the shows that the Atheist Community of Austin produces through the Atheist Experience Network, we've got a new feature here, which I think everybody's loving, that gives us a giggle just in case you missed something. So here's what you might have missed this week. So the new thing is jump humping, which is a soak, but you get your friend to jump on the bed while you're doing it so that they, so that they're the ones doing the motion. So as not to offend God. Whether you think chocolate tastes yeah, good because you yeah. like the taste of chocolate or chocolate Harvey. tastes good because the chocolate man is the creator of the universe. And like, said you have to like chocolate because it's the best. <laughs> I hear it's a really tiny holiday anyways, but you know. <laughs> mm. Well, you know, it's colder. <laughs> So, you know, there's, there's bound to be some shrinkage. If he's given us something interesting to grab onto with our little teeth, let's see where it takes us. Okay? That's true. And before anybody says anything about the little teeth, Johnny still has his baby teeth. And we're not mm -hmm. going to shame him for that. I don't want to beat up on, on anybody unnecessarily, especially right. if their view of it is, well, it's atheism with some extra steps. Okay. <laughs> Everything yeah, is atheism with some extra steps. put the spirit can on thank you for that okay we're gonna put our hands on here um was that oh <laughs> there, there's the hand sorry it takes a little bit to get over there um uh come on i gotta put my hand on here there we go there we go okay amazing i i i love jump pumping that that's the new thing i'm gonna talk about all the time it's impeccable to me that people think they can trick God. Like, we're not actually fucking, but we're almost like, mm, wow. Yeah. You're right. It's really strange. But I'm happy to say that Robin's back with us. So uh, cool. we did our promo, Robin. I don't know what you heard while you were gone, but let's try this again. Um, yes. So in propositional logic, there's a proposition. Some God exists. I can accept that proposition, which means that I am convinced that it's true or likely true, or I can not accept that proposition, which means that I am not convinced it's true. But if I don't accept it, 
that does not mean that I accept the proposition that no gods exist. Are we in, at least in agreement there? Yes, I'm familiar with that. Yes, um, but I'm I'm talking more on the grounds or on the on the basis that whenever we're, whenever we're uh, operating, we're operating under a metaphysical framework. Okay, I don't see how that changes. So the the thing here is you're claiming you're claiming that neutrality toward God is impossible, and I just described. Well, I don't I don't know what I described may not be neutrality in the way that you think about it, but we just acknowledged that it's possible for someone to not be convinced that a God exists and for them to not be convinced that that God doesn't exist. Now, if you're talking about a different type of neutrality, then I guess we need a definition of that. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't. So I, when you said that, I, I mean, I, I agreed to something, but I did, that's not what I meant to agree to. So I, I take back my agreement to what you just said then. So, um, so, okay. So there's a proposition that some God exists and some people will accept that proposition and some people will not accept that proposition. Can we at least agree with that? Yes. And those are the only two options. You either accept the proposition or you do not accept the proposition. Correct. Now, for the people who do not accept the proposition, some of them may also accept the contrary proposition that no God exists, but not all of those people have to accept that, correct? Um, well, that, that what you just said is not true if we're going to be conceive of God as, as some sort of an ultimate uh, metaphysical grounds for things. I'm, I'm sorry, but what God is or how you conceive of God is irrelevant to that question. Yeah. This is about, for the category of people who do not accept Proposition A, some of them may accept Proposition not A, and some of them may also not be convinced of Proposition not A. It is possible to be, like, for example... Proposition, O.J. Simpson murdered Nicole. It's possible to not be convinced that that is true and to not be convinced that that is false, correct? Yes. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Why is it that the proposition some God exists is different in your scenario than one about a murderer? Because God is in the category, at least the one I'm talking about, is in the category of, of a metaphysical context or worldview. And so if everyone has a worldview or a metaphysical framework, then they're going to, then whatever framework that they hold to being true, then every other framework they're going to have to reject as being false. If you hold that X is true, then you have to believe not X is false. I, I agree. But not being convinced that a proposition is true does not mean that you must be convinced that it's false. If you're convinced that a God exists, you can't simultaneously be convinced that it doesn't exist because that would be irrational. But if I'm not convinced that a God exists, I can also not be convinced that that God doesn't exist. Yeah, but do you understand that if we have, so, okay, I'll just walk through this. So when I said, when I earlier said, I said earlier that everyone has a metaphysical framework, a framework of reality. So ultimately you can answer questions like, what, what does it mean to be fact? Uh, why, why are facts the facts? What, is, what does it mean for things to be true, false, uh, possible, impossible? You, you accept that everyone has a metaphysical framework that they're operating under, right? I, I don't know that that's necessarily true or how it makes it changes this because I'm talking about propositional logic. I know that. But, I'm t- I, but so there, there are certain things that we can be neutral about, and there are certain things that we cannot be neutral about. What I'm, what I am trying to explain is that the things that we cannot be neutral about are things such as uh, all-encompassing worldviews. Okay, world. Well, I, I don't agree that that is possible. I am not convinced that your metaphysical assertion is true. I'm also not convinced that it's false. You need to make the case for one or the other. Okay. I'll do so by analogy. So do you, do, you, do you agree that in order for an ethical framework to make any sense at all, that we need to have an, a meta-ethical framework which is going to answer questions like, what does it mean for things to be good or bad or that we should or should not do things? If we don't, I, I don't know. I don't know, and I don't know how that's relevant to what we're talking about because we're not talking about an ethical framework. We're talking about whether or not a God exists. A God is a proposition about something that is either real or not. I'm comparing a metaphysical framework to a meta-ethical framework, and just this scope is a scope and it's analogy, okay? It so, won't make any difference because analogies aren't perfect. Why can't you stick with the one? What is this, What is it special about God that says you cannot be both 
it, you cannot be both not convinced it exists and not convinced it doesn't exist. What is special about a God? Because he's in the category of a metaphysical context, which you've said that three or four times. Did you think I missed that? Please explain it. Just stating it that's is not an explanation. That's why I'm giving. That's why I'm giving an analogy. I don't want an analogy. I want you to explain how God is excluded from the basics of proper fucking logic. Okay. If we don't have a metaphysical framework that's going to answer questions like, what does it mean for things to be facts? And when you okay fact, then it's going to be meaningless, okay? Because we don't understand what does it mean for things to be facts. Same with things being being false or possible or impossible, okay? Because they don't have a ground. Robin, I genuinely don't give a fuck. I agree that we have to have some understanding of what is and isn't a fact. I've asked repeatedly, and this is the last time I'm going to ask, what God are you advocating for, and why is that God exempted from not being convinced and not being convinced? Because then if you agree to that, and if God is a metaphysical context that's going to answer those questions, okay, then whatever metaphysical framework you hold to is either going to be the God framework or the not God framework. Uh, no, sir. That's an assertion about a particular type of God that, that you are declaring is required because you are using God as a grounding for a metaphysical framework. But I don't accept that metaphysical framework, you see? I don't accept a metaphysical framework that is grounded upon God because there isn't sufficient evidence to accept that metaphysical framework. You're not focusing on what I, on what I said. Uh, what you, all right, then you should email and put up an argument because this is making no sense to anybody, and we're all tired of hearing you say metaphysical over and over and avoiding the question. There is a proposition, I mean, and that proposition is some God exists. Are you going to define that God for us? I, I just did. I said that God is defined. No, as sir, you did not. No, no, sir, you did not, and we're done. I said that multiple Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I've, I've wouldn't a on. metaphysical framework, quote-unquote, be composed of, like, claims? Isn't that kind of like, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. You can say that God is, is part of a metaphysical framework all you want, and that we does not explain yeah, yeah. how your God is somehow exempted from. Well. It's really straightforward. Uh, and and the, the easy way that we know that Robin's wrong is that it's entirely possible for a human being to not understand something and therefore to not be convinced either way. That is simply just a fact that there are, and, and that's probably what he's going to claim. Oh, Matt just didn't understand it. Well, if I don't understand it, then I am not mean. convinced either way, which refutes your assertion that you cannot be neutral on it. I, I don't understand, but anyway, we got a bunch of callers waiting. Let's keep going. Stephen in Washington has a question about uh, church power and belief in God. So welcome, Stephen. Hey, Matt um, and Arden. I was just speaking to you yesterday. Uh, yeah, hey, Stephen. I, uh, you'd mentioned about potentially starting my own call-in show, and I um, went down to Target this morning with my daughter. She told me which headset to get, and she set up a Twitch account for me. So, Hell yeah, that's awesome. Way to go. Um, so the topic that I wanted to um, talk to you all about, um, so you always ask, what do you believe and why? Um, I, I, Oddly enough, I'm more nervous talking about this than any other time that I called in, but uh, I am an Episcopalian. I believe in um, God and his son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and that I have a relationship with that God. Um, I believe that truth is determined through uh, communal uh, determinations and that every person has their own truth and that then communicating to that to you um, is a way for you to arrive at your own truth. Like atheists might not be a hundred percent correct, but their perspective is key to understanding God as a whole. Well, oh. I, I'm, I'm going to jump in for a second and then I'm going to let Arden and, and go on with this because I absolutely unequivocally 
repeatedly reject the notion that each person has their own individual truth. Each person may have their own opinions about what is or isn't true, but truth doesn't give a shit for anybody's opinion. Something is either true or it's not independent of what any person thinks. Yeah. I, I would love to ask you, Stephen, like, I, I, I hear this, kind of concept of like my truth a lot and i'm totally going to straight up steal this from like anthony bag bosco right but if, if i have like a jar of, of gumballs in my hand and like it, it's either even or it's odd right there, there's no like if you say well it's odd and that's my truth that doesn't mean anything like th there's a truth to how many gumballs are in that jar correct sure um and so if you're looking at using your example, if you're looking at a gumball jar, um, there's a number of different ways that you could arrive at the correct answer of how many gumballs are in fact in that jar. Um, measurement would be probably the most precise. Um, but I think that when we're talking about um, issues of like the best way to live one's life, um, that communal determinations between various disparate belief groups and just individuals throughout the world. Um, that's the best way to come to an answer on those que those types of questions. Well, I, I don't know that it necessarily is because I think, I think there's like, we can learn facts of the matter about what kind of things are, are good for, I mean, you're, you're saying communal truths and I'm not even entirely sure what that means, but if I were to assume like, it kind of sounds like you're saying, oh, like in a, in a community of believers, like their truth is what's good for them. And that might be like a belief in God or something. But if what's actually helping them is like demonstrably like the, the community aspect, that's not that's not the belief in God that's helpful there, you know. So I, can you maybe it maybe would be helpful if you explain to me what you mean by uh, what was the term you used? Communal? Communal. Yeah, I, I'd love an example of what you think is a communal truth and how you can tell that it's true. Okay. Um, so so uh, community is a really big deal, especially in my church specifically, but the Episcopalian church as a whole um, focuses on building community. Not that other churches don't, but it's um, something that we kind of centralize around. Um, and as far as like what a communal truth would look like, um, I would say like, uh, it's just something here's actually a really good example. Um, I have been struggling with, uh, choosing a career path for a long time now, and I've landed in a position that I am like at my core happy with what I'm doing. Um, and you know, I took perspectives from everybody around me, everybody in my community, um, and each of them had a something they believed was true about me and about what I should do with my life. And I took each of those truths to and learned from them to arrive at what so, ended up being the best answer for me. Yeah, I, so I, I wouldn't call what you're talking about their truth. Like, it, if you were to say... I, I was trying to figure out what career path would be best for me. And I asked the people in my life who I, I value what their perspective on my ideas was. That's not asking for like their truth. That's asking for their perspective on a, a specific issue regarding, you know, taking into account things they know about you. To me, that that's not a truth. That's, that's like a, an opinion or a suggestion or a recommendation. Um, this this definition of truth feels very loose and and shaky. It's worse and, than that. It, yeah. It's worse than that because what you just described was you asked a bunch of people what they thought about you and they, you took their truths, which did any of them disagree in their assessment of you? Absolutely. Yeah, which means that some of them might might have been correct and the ones that disagreed are wrong. And maybe none of them were correct, but also you asserted that after taking all this on board, you made a career path that you're happy with. And, but you also said that it was the best answer for you, but you don't know that you have no clue whether or not this is the best answer or the right answer. You might just be rationalizing that, well, these are the people who convinced me. So I'm going to be happy with this. Absolutely nothing you have described in any way demonstrates truth. 
you have no idea if those people told you what they actually believe. You have no idea if their views about you were accurate or not. You have no way of telling who's tr who's correct and who's not. You have no way of saying that because these people told you this, it didn't actually influence your decision or your happiness about it. It's all self-reported. This is all just incredibly fuzzy thinking that has nothing to do with truth. Sure, I, I understand. Um, I understand what you're saying. I, I mean, a core piece of this um, community I'm talking about is I know all of these people. If they, you know, departed from what has consistently been their perspective about me and about what would be best for my well-being, that would be kind of a red flag for me that they weren't being truthful. Why isn't it a well, red flag? Why isn't it a red flag that you don't care whether or not it's true? You just want their con their opinions of you to be consistent. Yeah, that's a red it, flag. You're not talking about truth. I don't, I don't think like if they gave you an answer, like that was like super off the mark, you're like, well, that's not like based on things I know about you and recommendations you give me in the past and our relationship together. That doesn't sound like a normal answer that you would give me. Like to me, that that's not like them being a truth that that could be a red flag of uh, like a million different things going on. You know, maybe they're having a psychological break. Maybe they're being, maybe they are being dishonest with you, or maybe you're like, not understanding what they're saying there could be a number of things going on there but it's not like they're sharing a, a mistruth or their truth or they're not being truthful um you're just talking about people's opinions about who you care about about what, like what's going on in your life I, I don't think that has anything to do with a personal truth um yeah i yeah i don't i don't Maybe I'm not communicating this well, but uh, like there are definitive facts about me and about what, you know, people observe about my life. Those things are true. I don't know. I don't know how that doesn't like. Well, correlate to okay. But if, if in fact there are facts about your life, how do you know what those facts are? And how do you know when somebody tells you what they think of you, whether or not it's consistent with the facts, because if you're going to say that it's true because it's consistent with the facts, I agree with you. Truth is that which is consistent with the facts, but it has nothing to do with anybody's opinion. I mean, if we're talking about a lifetime of events that have happened over someone being alive, people will have different perspectives on those things. And I feel like each of them is valuable to arriving at sure. a I agree, sure. but each that doesn't mean valuable. any of them are true. We're asking you, how do you tell which ones are true? I have a bunch of people around me and they all have opinions about me. And some of those opinions might be true. And some of those opinions aren't true. I'm asking for how you find out what's true. And if you say, well, you look at the facts, I agree, but that's not what you talked about. I want to know what a communal truth is. How on earth, can a community have a truth? How do you demonstrate what's true? Popularity? Uh, look, Stephen, I, you know, I love you. I think you're great. Um, I, I do think uh, maybe maybe it'll be worth like uh, uh, taking some time off and, and thinking about some of the questions we were asking you and how, like how they make you feel and where you land and stuff. Um, I, I do think it's really important though to, to, like when we're talking about definitions about things that are really big like this or concepts that are really big, rather definitions are really important. So like, I, I think hashing out what we mean when we say truth is, is huge. And for what it sounds like from what you're describing is that you're in my opinion, from my definition, understanding of how these words are defined, you're conflating truth with opinion. Um, like I, I asked my stepdad for advice recently on, on uh, some, career paths and stuff and he told me exactly what he thought but i don't think he was sharing me with me his his truth i think he was sharing me his opinions if he sat down with me and said you know listed the factual accomplishments or accomplishments i've made that could be i guess sharing truth with me but it wouldn't be sharing his truth it's just the truth so yeah i think it, it sounds like we're doing a lot of definitions around or a lot of dancing around definitions and it it, it might be worth taking some time to iron out exactly what you mean when you say these things. Yeah, um, because we're, we're all in agreement. If somebody can have an opinion about a fact and their opinion can be true or it might not be true. The whole point is to figure out how do we tell what the truth is? And so in your communal truth, 
Is it just, what, what is your measure for figuring out if somebody tells you something, how, 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 is it true or not? So I might have, I might have a resolution to this. And I think, I think I know where we're getting off step here. Um, so if someone was to describe, uh, Matt, if someone was to describe your personality as, um, like strong and independent or outspoken, uh, or very, uh, loyal, any of those characteristics, would you say that they're them saying that is stating something that is true about you? No, I would say that I either agree or disagree with that. Those, those are opinion assessments. And if there were facts to demonstrate that those were the case, then I'm happy to accept the facts. But if somebody just says, uh, oh, Matt's an asshole. Well, that could be true depending on how we defined asshole. I, I'm perfectly willing to accept that. But them saying it is completely irrelevant to whether or not it's true. It's true independent of whether anybody says it or not. And if somebody says, Matt, you're being an asshole, I can say, and I have, I agree with you. But that's about what I agree with. Right. I'm that, asking that, about truth. That comes back to the whole concept of, of the, the gumballs in the jar is that like you may say like, oh, I don't know, 52. And you may be right. Or you may just be like taking a wild guess, but there is an actual truth of the matter there. And like, I, I know we talk about trans rights a lot because you've called into my show multiple times. Like when we're talking about like gender identity, while yeah, language and how we describe it and how we communicate it and what it means to be a woman to an individual in like the social sense might vary greatly. I wouldn't call that a like a, a personal truth. Those are opinions. There's a fact of the matter about your gender. You know, you either are trans or you are not. Um, so, so I think it's really important to understand that when we're talking about like the truth of the matter, we're talking about like something that comports with reality, like an actual fact about reality. That's that's where truth is. And when you're talking which, about which, by like, the way, how someone feels about you, that's not the same thing. Yeah, which, by the way, you may have a different definition of truth and we're just never, ever going to agree. But for me, the facts determine what the truth is, not opinions. And it may be like, so if let's say, for example, Stephen, that your opinion of me is that I'm too uh, brusque. It's a fact that that's your opinion of me. And I will accept that it's a fact that that's your opinion of me. Um, I would probably even accept that or say that I agree with you. But when we're talking about whether or not there's a fact, and, and I want to get past this because the communal truth thing that you described, I can't make any sense of it all. But I also don't know how it's relevant to whether or not there's a God. And you're convinced that you have a personal relationship with a God. There's not a single person who I have a personal relationship with that I cannot introduce you to. I don't know what it means sure. to have a personal relationship with someone that it's, it's, it's in the ballpark of, oh, you, you wouldn't know them. They go to another school. If you have a personal relationship with somebody, how could you possibly, how could it possibly be the case that you can't demonstrate that? Um, so this, this actually gets more onto the actual topic that I initially was going to call about, um, or initially called about. Um, I, I believe in that I'm justified in that belief, um, because of, because of the power that is in the church. Um, what power? The, the power that the church within my community, um, makes it so that I, um, I think I'm justified in believing in it. But is that, does that if you're talking about the power of your community, like the power of them to support you and help you make decisions or accomplish goals or something that doesn't demonstrate that Jesus exists or that God exists. That just demonstrates that community is really important for humans and that we really need groups of people. And that generally, unless you're, if you're not like a billionaire, you're probably someone who could use a little help from the people around you. That, that doesn't demonstrate that a God exists. That just demonstrates that, humans are helpful to other humans sometimes. 
Yeah, I, I really want to know what you mean by the power of the church. So I guess I'm, what I'm saying is it's worth it for me to believe because um, when I'm in the church, it uh, gives a lot of benefits to me, to my community. It's the uh-huh. main thoroughfare through and donate food to Steven. people that we provide housing for. Stephen, you literally just described you believe it because there's a benefit to believing it which is separate from whether or not it's true. Of course, there's a benefit to being in the most popular group on the planet. Of course, there's a benefit when you move to a new area. Hey, here's a church ready made for you and a whole community, and we'll help each other out. And here's some people who are going to make meals for you. All of that is absolutely true. There's massive, massive benefits to believing, even though there's no reason to think it's actually true but you said that you had a personal relationship with God, which is in a completely different category from whether or not it's practically useful to believe there's a God. What's this personal relationship? I can't be, I can't be in the church unless I have that relationship. It, it's no, sir, that's not true. No, that's, that's absolutely not true. I, there's plenty of people. So first of all, the Bible points out that there's people in the church uh, who are not believers. There are many, you know, that that's right in there. We recognize that from long before either of us were born, but I've been to church and I've been a member of a church and I don't think that that was true. I didn't, I I thought I had a relationship, but I did not have a relationship. The only thing that's required for you to be a member of a church is for you to pretend or to actually be convinced that you have a relationship with God. There is no requirement and there cannot be a requirement that you actually have a relationship with God. How do you demonstrate that you do? What I mean is that I can't in good conscience be a member of my church and just not believe the things that that church believes. Yeah. Steven, so I, I, Steven I, that's, you're, you're skipping so, past the question. I, I fully, I'm not saying, you just described, you can't be a member of that church if you don't accept it. Fine. You told us you had a personal relationship with God. How do you prove that? Okay. Um, So when I say that I have a personal relationship with God, when I am communicating with God, Jesus, um, it's very similar to how people describe uh, meditation. And I know that you said you had those feelings before and that it's perfectly explainable through other means that have nothing to do with Jesus, but that stimulus plus the necessity of belief, if I'm honestly going to participate in that church leads me to just accept it because of, because partially of the benefits, because it's always been a part of my life. I didn't ask Stephen, 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 stop. I'm not quite, I'm not questioning whether or not you believe I'm not questioning your sincerity. I'm asking what reason you have to say that you have a relationship with God. How could you demonstrate that to anyone else? You can't even demonstrate it to yourself. And the descriptions you gave are like, Oh, it's similar to how people describe meditation. Well, that has nothing to do with whether or not there is in fact a God that you're communicating with. I'm not saying that you don't believe it. I believe that you believe it. I'm asking, why are you convinced and how could you demonstrate to anyone else that you have a relationship with a God? Okay. Um, So if you're looking for like physical hard evidence for to demonstrate at least what that my belief um, and how to correlate that to a physical state of my brain, you could probably stick my ass in an MRI and I'll pray and it'll show a certain pattern. And that's God to me. Well, Stephen, that's that's not God. That's an MRI result that shows what your brain is doing. You are now grossly rational. Go ahead, Arden. I'm sorry. That's just like, I mean, kind of like your point, you're comparing it to, to meditation. Like meditation is a completely physiological thing that's happening. You're, you're inducing a brain state, you know, it's, if you're telling me that 
when you pray to Jesus, you induce some sort of brain state to you that makes you feel good. I totally believe you. The question is whether or not there's a, a God involved and you're claiming there is. So we're asking how, how do you know that? How do you know it's not just a brain state? What happens that makes it uh, qualitatively different from just having a physiological brain state? Maybe this will help. Is it possible that someone could be convinced they have a personal relationship with a God and be wrong about it? Absolutely. So here's two people. One person is, con they're both convinced they have a relationship with God. One of them does and one of them doesn't. How do we tell the difference? I don't know. I don't either, but you're the one who's claiming that you do know because you've made a decision when you just acknowledge that you don't have a method to reach that conclusion. That's the point. I can't tell the difference. I don't know how anybody can tell the difference, but you are claiming to be able to tell the difference because you're convinced that you are one of those people, the one that actually has a relationship with God. Do you see the problem? I'm not saying you're wrong about whether you have a relationship with God. I'm saying you are convinced you do while simultaneously acknowledging that you don't have any way to tell whether or not you do. That's fair. I, um, but Steven, I I, what I'm, I'm going to jump in here really quick really because not. I feel like maybe this conversation is a little overwhelming for you. I don't I don't know if you've watched the show before or if you like knew what you're getting yourself into. I I, uh, I think we've been on this call for a while too, so we probably should move on to some other calls. But um, uh, well, yeah, I want I, I want to give me a chance to, to finish. I don't want to just want to delete. I realize that that is a a sticking point that's difficult for people, and yeah, I, I have I no problem with Stephen. I have no that. problem with Stephen. Stephen's been honest and getting getting to yeah. acknowledge this, it's a weird position to find out, hey, I'm convinced that I'm in one of these two categories while also being convinced I can't tell the difference between those categories. I just wanted to make sure it makes sense. I don't have, I don't want to beat up on Steven. That's not the, the goal. No, and I, I'm, I didn't, I, I don't feel like I'm being beat up on. It's, Good. I think the problem is that if I, if I actually accept that I don't believe it, that I won't be able to be part of my church anymore. And that it just, Ooh. it changes a lot about my life. And I guess I'm just kind of afraid of what that means. Yeah. So, well, Steven, um, but that, can, uh, I, can I just interject really quickly? Guys, <laughs> I, I just want to, I just want to point out that it may well be that if you find out you don't believe and that you, publicly declare that in some fashion which you aren't obligated to do but if you do it may well be that your church community doesn't want you around but I, doesn't that speak to that maybe this community isn't as closely knit or really as good of a community as you think it is if they're willing to uh kick you out or deny support from you where they otherwise would have you know uh let go of relationships that they've built with you because you aren't convinced of a proposition that they also are probably not able to justify or explain in any kind of way that doesn't that make those relationships seem kind of like phony in some sense that they just, it's like, as long as you're all, it's like if you were in like this Marvel fan club and you're all like, everyone here says Iron Man is the best superhero. But the second you say, well, you know, Iron Man's cool, but I, I think I might like another one. And they're all like, yeah, get the fuck out. <laughs> like that's, <laughs> That shows you your community is kind of shitty. Like, it, to be fair, I think it's I think it's a great I mean, point, but I also realize that we're all going to draw our lines somewhere. Sure. And you know, like the atheist community of Austin isn't going to allow members who don't identify as atheists. Uh, but it doesn't mean we're going to cut people off just because they disagree on something. But yeah, I'm sorry, Stephen. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that they would cut me off or anything. It's just I don't. I don't know if I could um, interact with them the way that I do now. Um, knowing that I would have to lie to them in order for them to see, in order for them to see me the way that they do now. Um, and I don't know how they, um, like, I don't know what would change if I didn't believe anymore. Um, and that's definitely something that I'm going to have to kind of digest for a little while, but, 
I sure. will, uh, I'll let you guys get onto other calls and you've given me a lot to think about and I, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much, Stephen. I appreciate it. And also I know this is a tough spot to be in because it, it, when you start to realize, Oh, Dan Dennett wrote a, a book where he talked about the difference between believing in something and believing in belief. And I, I think all of us would recognize there's a huge advantage to being in the popular kids group. And right now we live in a world where Christianity of some stripe is the popular kids group, like 30% or so worldwide. Uh, but Definitely. I will say that's 30% versus all the other categories. If you stack it up against, there's like 70% of the world that don't fit into there. And who yeah. knows what people are, where, where people are going to go, but I appreciate your, your answers and your honesty uh, and how difficult this is. So keep thinking. And if you change your mind, great. And if you don't great, but you're doing more than most people I interact with, which is you're actually thinking about it and you're willing to answer things uh, that are difficult. So Absolutely. I appreciate that greatly. Thank you for, yeah. Thank you for calling Stephen. I, I, I always appreciate Stephen So, so greatly. Uh, very honest interlocutor definitely cares about the well being of people around him. Yep. And uh, I, I think that's more than you can say for a lot of the theists that we engage with on this sort of platform. We get a lot of people who are, you know, kind of, kind of hateful people have some bigotry associated with their beliefs and, uh, I will say Stephen is absolutely not one of those people and I, I wish him the best. Yep. I I'm completely in agreement. We have uh, LaRue pronouns are she, her in Illinois wants to talk about uh, who is it sociopathic to believe a particular thing about God. Welcome LaRue. How are you? Hi, pretty good. Um, So I had a relative who someone said something to him. Uh, he had a fight with his sister and then it was his sister's father-in-law. He, he told his sister, I'm so angry, I'm going to kill you. And then the father-in-law called up and said, if you hurt Susan, I'm going to, I'll kill you. And then years later, the man's son, they were electricians. And his son died because I think he wasn't handling uh, the wires properly. And uh, he, he thinks that the man's son died because of, what he said to him, he said, some people are just, who are going to hell anyway, are just bodies to be used to avenge him. And uh, well, I was wondering, I had an argument with a relative that said, that's not sociopathic, but and she said, you need to ask a psychiatrist, but uh, I just wanted to know your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, sociopathic is, is difficult because I mean that's not really like a a diag well I guess it used to be some sort of diagnostic term if I'm understanding that correctly but I may be wrong please correct me in the chat if you happen to know um but I mean like I, I think it's better to just focus on is that a fucked up thing to do because then the answer is clearly yes if you're trying to say is it sociopathic there it gets a little muddier and I feel like it obfuscates from the reality of the situation which is it's abusive it's wrong it treats people like they're objects um, and that that's not okay. Uh, I think when you get on the sociopathic thing, yeah, it becomes a little too muddy, but um, I don't know, Matt, what do you think? Well, I, I'm not in a position where I'm gonna actually be trying to diagnose someone, but I think that given you know the, the norms about how we use language like that, uh, I don't think it would be that far off to say that something like that qualifies as somewhat sociopathic. In a colloquial sense, sure. Yeah, yeah, but not as, as you know, I'm not going to be diagnosing anybody. But I think that the problem is, is that whether or not it qualifies as sociopathic or not is almost irrelevant. It's something that all of us, uh, or, or nearly all of us, would and should find um, problematic or undesirable or bad in a colloquial sense of, you know, like, oh, if, if anybody did this to me, that would be bad. So why is it all of a sudden good um, when there's supposedly a God doing it? And quite often what we see are they, they want to claim, oh, well, because God is, you know, the, uh, the ultimate arbiter of right and wrong, and therefore whatever God does must be right. Uh, and I don't think that that really flies. Um, but I, I don't know what else to say about it. It's, is it a bad thing? Yeah, as far as I can tell, it's awful. But I don't know that that means 
uh, I, I don't, I don't know what we get by calling it sociopathic. Right. Uh, well, sociopaths see people as objects. So, and this isn't the only time he's thought one time he thought someone's wife had a stroke because they made an ill-considered remark to him. And I, I mean, this is not normally um, what Christians believe. I know they wouldn't. Yeah. I, I think you got to be careful with something like sociopaths believe people are objects because like antisocial personality disorder is a really complex disorder. And there are some people who might have like, uh, you know, the inability to experience empathy on an emotional level, but can logic their way to empathy. And it it, it becomes like, that. that's kind of, I think the point we're getting at is that I totally hear you. And you're just basically what you're trying to communicate is that if that were true, that's super fucked up and God shouldn't be that way. But it doesn't really provide any utility to describe it that way. I think it's more useful to just point out that that's like, inconsiderate and manipulative and abusive types of behavior and if it were coming from a human being you could probably like litigate on those grounds but because as matt pointed out it's from god we're supposed to think of it as like judgment divine judgment or something of that effect and but i, I yeah. totally hear you and i think it, it is fucked up and i think in a colloquial sense if you're just kind of like joking with friends and being like wow god's a sociopath like yeah sure you can say that and we all know what you mean but at the end of the day, you could just say, if if anybody else did this or tried to do this, we would all object. I don't whether or not we call it sociopathic or not. Um, and, and trust me, I've had I've had relatives who who viewed God as if God was the the avenger who's going to come and and right the wrongs that have been done to people, despite the fact the Bible doesn't. And they were Christian. I don't want to say everybody is, but they were a Bible believer, and the Bible doesn't even advocate for that. But depending on which God they're talking about if they're really just trying to use God as like a tool for what they hope would be vengeance, they're almost talking something closer to karma. Um, yeah. And at that point, it would depend on what was right and what was just rather than revenge because, um, you know, taking out a, a, a bad guy uh, may be a just thing. But hopefully that answers it a little bit. I don't, I don't know if there's much more to add to it though, LaRue. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Matt and Arden. Yeah, thanks so much. We've got uh, a couple minutes until the show's over, and there's three callers. I don't know that we're going to necessarily get to all of them, but we're going to do our best here. Tate in Arizona, pronouns are he, him. What do religious people mean when they talk about objective or subjective morality? Is that, is that the question you've been waiting for? Uh, yes. Um, I myself am an atheist, too, so I whenever uh i always get into like um kind of like arguments with religious people they always like bring up well how do you know something's objectively good and how do you know something's not like they they always like to go to the objective morality arguments and it's kind of hard to understand what they mean by that because like they just bring like and i've heard people talk about it touch on that a lot but it's just kind of like hard to understand because there's like so many things you gotta understand yeah and, and so I'll give you about the quickest answer I can, which is A, uh, if you want to find out what they mean by something, you you got to ask them. I will say that quite frequently, everybody gets confused about this because um, they try to equate objective with absolute. And so there's a confusion there. All the difference between objective and subjective is, is subjective would be, it's the product of a mind. It is just somebody's opinion that murder is immoral. Objective means that it doesn't matter what anybody's opinion is. This is actually immoral, independent. Everybody in the world could think it's right and it could turn out to be wrong. Um, and all we're doing in that sense is comparing the consequences of somebody's action to a goal. Now we can disagree about the goals, just like we could disagree about the rules for different games. I use chess as an analogy quite often. But for the moral question, it's either, if it's just a product of your mind, then like to, to go with the big Lebowski route, which I'm not a fan of and I'm probably going to get wrong, but it's like, that's just like your opinion, dude. Uh, and so that's their objection. The real truth here is that when yeah. theists object to secular morality, every objection that they can, every objection they've ever launched to secular morality, yeah. they can't solve. I... Because their their thing is, look, what what would a secular humanist point to as a source for morality? And for me, I like to point to well-being. And it's not 
you know, robust. It's not all this again, but, uh, but they're like, oh, well, why on earth is that the standard? And I don't think that, I think it's this, just the standard we agreed on that we care about our well being. It seems absurd to not care about well being, but nobody has to. There's nothing in the universe declaring I must care about well being, but there's also nothing that says I must care what their God says or what they say their God says, because I don't even know what their God says because their God won't spend a minute talking to me. All I know is what they say. And so if they can say, here's what God says is moral and you shouldn't wear short skirts or have sex with people outside of marriage, I can say, well, I don't care what your God says. Yeah. I'm looking at actual fucking harm here. And uh, you can look down on me and say I'm immoral all day long for having sex outside of marriage. Um, but I'm going to say it's a good thing and that you should get your busy, bossy nose out of my business. And until your God comes down and tells me that it's wrong and why it's wrong, in which case I'll correct your God too, uh, I don't care what your view is. Yeah. Um, I also find it to be like a very retarded argument as well. Cause like, okay. It's okay. Stop. Done. I absolutely despise and will not allow that word to be used here. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I, I understand it can be used in a, in a clinical sense of retarding progress, et cetera, but uh, it drives me bonkers. And so let's just, Let's go with it's not a particularly rational, it's not a particularly sound, it's any number of things without going to like slurs. Yeah, please forgive me about that. Uh, sure. But I do find it to not be, I just find it to be illogical and not really with good reason because like, because their purpose is like for a God to exist, there has to be like a difference to manifest or to detect right and wrong. And well, the reason we have, um, Objective morality. Well, reason we have that is because because uh, if we didn't if we didn't have the law, for example, then if we just allowed murder, then we would cease to exist. For example, well, I don't know if that's the case, but well, I don't know. Uh, I, I've done the best I can to explain the difference between that. You might have to talk to them about what, about what they mean. Um, but I appreciate it. I got to get to a couple more calls real quick before we end. So thanks, Tate. All right. Yep. No problem. I'm going to do one real quick. Uh, Charles, he, him in Canada. How are you doing, Charles? No bad. My name is Charles. I'm from, I was born in Africa. Anyway, I want to tell you something. Uh, like you and Christopher Hitchens, you are the people that changed my mind. I mean, it changed my, my life. It changed my world. But, well, don't blame me. You're the one that thinks. I, I just talk. <laughs> but, you are like you have done stuff that even La Paz civilization haven't done. They don't have no idea what you are doing. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I have a problem with one issue all the time okay. talking about people. You say, oh, there's not enough evidence for God. Right. And I say, oh, wow, uh, I believe there's not enough evidence for God and there's no evidence for God are two different things. So when yeah. you are saying that there's not enough evidence for God, I see there's a little bit of evidence for God. Which no, must... I, I say that, I say that because if I say there's no evidence for God, some pedant will come in and say, Oh, well, there's anecdotal evidence for God. There's testimonial evidence for God. And then I have to say, yes, but I'm talking about whether or not there's good evidence. So I stopped saying there's no evidence for God. Instead, I'll either say there's no good evidence for God or there's not enough evidence for God, just so I don't have to sit here to every pedant who wants to come in and say, well, there's anecdotal evidence. Uh, that's the only reason for that. Yeah, because all the time when you say that, I was just say, okay, can you explain why he's saying that there's no, like, there's enough evidence for God? I, I, say, I want to see a little bit of evidence. Because for me, I don't have, I don't, there's no, there's zero. The, the little bit of evidence is anecdotal. It's testimonial. It's people who claim they've experienced God, people who claim they've seen God or interacted with God or have a relationship. Those are testimonies. They're never going to be enough. You can stack up all of them. Everybody yeah. in the world could think that they had a relationship with God, and that wouldn't be enough evidence. But Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, uh, anyway, I mean, I was just confused because all the time we're just saying, oh, so don't say that there's not enough evidence. Say that there's no evidence for God. <laughs> that's yep. not my problem. Apart from apart from that, man, I love you. I love you so bad. Like I, just talking to you, I'm shivering. Yeah. Well, <laughs> go put a jacket so on, you. Charles. <laughs> Thank you, sweet. Yeah. You anyway, know, I got one more call to get to. I hope that cleared it up for you, Charles. No idea what you have done to my life. You don't have no idea. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, Charles. I hope it's been good. And uh, if it wasn't, it was somebody else's fault. All right, we have one last call today, and uh, right. I wanted to make sure we got to it because Jake's been sitting here waiting patiently from the UK, uh, wanting some advice in dealing with uh, family. So welcome, Jake. How are you? Uh, hi, Matt. Hi, Arden. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I was just wondering, because I usually have a good relationship with all my family members, but my Jehovah's Witness aunt and uncle will keep persisting on you have to be a witness. We want you to be a witness. I'm just saying to them, look, I don't want to be because um, I have my own views and my own beliefs and I'm happy with them. Can I leave? Can you just... They said, no, you'll be destroyed at Armageddon. And I'm just thinking, what do I do? Because I don't think I'm going to be able to convince them that they're wrong. But at the same time, I don't want to ruin my relationship with them because they're actually quite nice to me apart from that. Yeah, I, so like this is a thing that we talk about a lot in the atheist community, right? About learning how to set strong, like firm boundaries for yourself and to be okay with how they respond. So I think, you know, the, the best thing you could do for yourself is say, it, you know, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe Armageddon will come and I will be destroyed. I don't think that's going to happen. And so I'm not too worried about it. But regardless, I, I, I don't believe and, I, I'm not interested in debating this with you. So I would appreciate it if we could have a relationship where we just don't talk about that. That That's a boundary for me. And if you continue to violate that boundary, you can set a, a new boundary. Say, okay, well then I'm, I'm not going to be coming over anymore. We'll just do like weekly phone calls or something. You know, you can, you can always ratchet your, your boundaries around what your personal needs are. But I, I definitely think it's important to be try your best rather because it's it's not communication it's not a perfect system but you know do your best to communicate exactly what your needs are exactly what your boundaries are for what you don't want to have happening with them and if they respect it great and if they don't well then you know you've told them what the conditions for a relationship with you were and they made their choice yeah and i agree with what arden's saying but i had one one quick question here jake and that is on the call screener thing, it lists you as a theist. So am I correct that you have some God belief that is not Jehovah's Witness? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm um, Church of England, so Protestant. Sure. Um, so so uh, that's my belief. It, it seems to me that in those types of situations, like I was a Southern Baptist, and I had family members who were Catholic. And my mom convinced oh. some of those Catholic people to give up Catholicism and become Southern Baptist. But I, I didn't do that. If I had family members who were coming after me and saying, oh, I'm a, you know, hey, you need to be a witness. Um, I think I would very frankly just say, well, I already have this belief here and I don't think that your belief is a true one. Um, you could have the conversations with them about why you think yours or your version is the right one. And they're going to come back with why they, they think theirs is the right one. Uh, I don't know how to win those arguments because my view is that you're both wrong. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, that's a good point. It's um, yeah, and 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 Matt, you know, I I, I agree because my my mum and dad are atheists, so that they say the same thing. They will say, yeah, you know, I don't agree that either of you are right. So um, they can't really comment. They can't really um comment on it. It's just um, the one thing you can do and the cults. One thing you can do, and this comes for setting yeah. boundaries, when you're having the conversation with them, say, how would you guys feel if every time I interacted with you, I came to you to tell you your 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 Jehovah's Witness stuff is um is bunk, it is blasphemy, and if you're not Church of England, you're gonna rot in hell forever. And if they can't understand how you could come to them with a similar sort of view that that they're coming to you with and that neither of you can establish the truth any better than anybody else. So maybe it's best if we just drop it. You believe what you believe. I believe what I believe. And let's try to be happy and friendly outside of that. Um, and if they can't, then, you know, I've had to cut people out of my life. Mostly I let them cut themselves out of my life. Um, but yeah, I don't have any better advice than that. Yeah. Um, unfortunately that the latter part of your comment was, was true. That's what I have said. I have said to them, look, this is what I believe. And they say, no, we're not going to accept that. 
you know, we, we, we are not going to accept that you're Church of England. You, we will we will get you to do a Bible study with us. I'm like, no, no, you won't. And they're like, we will. <laughs> it's just like, okay, I'm sorry. I just like, I want to have a relationship with, with, with my aunt and uncle, but they, they just will not accept where I stand. And, and it really hurts me. And my other family members are like, Jake, you know, you've got your own issues. You've got your own life. And if they don't want to accept it, then, there is no, apparently there's there's probably no, it's not immoral for me to say to them, look, if you're going to be like this, then don't bother to call me then. Apparently that wouldn't Absolutely. be immoral. To do that. No, no, not at all. That People have to cut pe- family members out of their life all the time because unfortunately, as much as we would like to believe, you know, our family are supposed to be the ones who are there to support you and make you feel loved and welcomed and all that. Some people's families aren't like that. And sometimes you have to set hard, uncomfortable boundaries with people that you may love dearly. And it it sucks. It really does suck. And I I don't want to minimize that at all because it's difficult to do, but it's absolutely not immoral for you to set a boundary with someone who's not respecting your needs or the fact that they're causing you distress by bringing this up every time they talk to you. Yeah. Um, one thing that you probably, you two probably know, but um, something I found out recently is that they're actually told to to do this by their leaders. My uncle is an elder, but he's, you know, they're actually told yeah. the end of the world is coming and you have to do this. So they're actually being told to do this, aren't they? It's not, they're not doing it off the right, well, they are doing it off their own back, but yeah, but I mean, this is the case. And, you happen to be in one of the versions of Christianity that, um, no offense uh, intended to you, although I'll, I'll offend yeah. C of E all day long and nobody will give a fuck because nobody cares about C of E. C of E is one of the, the weakest, you know, Hey, there's not really anything here. We're, we're, we're just, we're, we're kind of like liking Jesus for the sake of liking Jesus. When I was a Southern Baptist, first Peter three fifteen is an obligation for all Christians to be prepared at all times to give a reason for the faith that's within them. And you're commanded by the Great Commission to go out and witness. These things are are like non-negotiable. There's no way, even if if I I put my Jesus hat back on, there's no way in hell I could be Catholic or uh, Church of England or JW. I mean, they're all ridiculously not consistent with my understanding of the Bible. But we can't get anywhere (laughs) that way. And so you, you, I, I hate to say it, Jake, as much as it sucks, there are people who are no longer part of my life because they can't accept who I am. And most of them showed themselves the door. There are other people who are no longer part of my life because they can't accept something else about my life. In this case, like I'm dating Arden. Sorry for anybody who didn't know. Uh, what? And yes. And anybody who won't accept Arden for who she is and won't accept us as a couple, they can go fuck themselves because I'd rather be happy and spend time with Arden than be miserable having somebody badger me about that. And the same thing is true if I had relatives that were Jehovah's Witnesses that are like, we're going to get you into a Bible study. And I'm like, for me, though, I'd be like, all right, bring it. I'll fucking do a Bible study with you right now. But that's because I have nothing to fear from a Bible study because I know it. But you got to figure out where your boundaries are. And that's what Arden was saying earlier. You're going to have to set your boundaries. And if you want to put up with more than most people would, that's your prerogative. I wouldn't put up with any of it. Mm. Yeah. And um, maybe I need to take a leaf out of your book, Matt, and say, if you don't, and say to these people, if you don't like who I am, then, and if you don't like my belief, then you don't have to stay, you know? Yeah. Maybe, you know, maybe that might be, um, that might be a way, but, um, yeah, but congratulations to you both. I, I didn't know that. I'm, it's, I'm really it's been months. I'm just mentioning it. To you, but, but thanks. <laughs> well, I hope it. I hope it's long and happy and full of full of joy. And I hope you don't get harassed like I, like I like I was. So um, yeah, I hope. But um, but yeah, but um, yeah. No, thank you for your time. And um, thank you for your advice. And yeah, um, all the best to you both. Thank you very awesome. much. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Awesome. That is the end of that. We got through all those calls. We, we did run a little over. But uh, for those people who asked, yeah, we're going to be hanging out in the Discord for a little while after, taking a couple of questions. Yeah. We appreciate everybody who tuned in today, everybody who 
uh, donate and contribute. I see that we got more than the 666 likes that I strive for on Wednesday nights, but uh, yeah, that's awesome. Ha! <sighs> what do you think? It was good. There was a good show. I felt a, a little, uh, some of the calls at the beginning were a little bit, um, just not, not calls I'm going to be able to handle well, but that's okay. Yeah. Uh, the rest of it was good. And I, I see chat is, is geeking out over your little announcement, even though it's not really an announcement because it's, it shouldn't be I've news. been on the show before and we've talked about it before, but yeah. you know, <laughs> it's not news to, yeah. to anybody, yeah. but, but it's news to somebody, but, um, I think that there were there are calls that came in today that I would like to continue as a philosophy nerd, philosophy geek, uh, in another venue, another forum, talking about you know oh this this metaphysical thing or that metaphysical, but it's not right for the show because if you're not able to present, and, and we do want people to call and tell us what they believe and why, but if you're not able to present, um, a, a, a say, seemingly short and structured argument supported by evidence. It's not going to get much weight here. That said, we had uh, some really great conversations here and getting to the truth of what people believe and what they, you know, do they believe in belief and how do we tell the difference and what's truth? Those are all important things. And there's more than one model for all of these. There's not, there's not just the, um, the notion that truth is that which comports with reality. There are other notions of truth. I just don't happen to accept them and I don't know how you, you can make a case for. But we appreciate the calls. And I appreciate the fact that I was around to fill in. We want to end today with um, a heartfelt uh, condolences and well wishes to Shannon and her family. We miss you. We love you. We look forward to getting you back on the show. Um, I can't wait to to see what a show looks like with Shannon and Arden on. Because uh, then I just get to sit Me back too. on the couch and and watch. And I think it's going to be... Uh, awesome. But on that note, thanks again to everybody in the crew. Pop yourself up on the screen if you can, unless you're like ready for the end credits and stuff like that. And all the people who are moderating in chat and screening calls and taking down notes and timestamps, a, a, a one of the many important positions that often goes on, overlooked. We will be back again next week. Please take care of yourself. Follow the guidelines safe in your area. And if you want to call in to tell us why you believe what you believe, do it. And if you're not ready for it, prep. You can do it on the Discord and other things, and you can reach out to some people you know who may be better at it than you are. Take care. We'll see you next week. What will it take for you to start opening your eyes, to stop questioning the bullshit everyone around you buys? You think it's It's time to get sexy, so watch Secular Sexuality Live Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc slash YTSS and call into the show at 512-991-9242 or connect to the show online at tiny.cc slash call sex.